Hi, this is Rob Kelly and this short PowerPoint video is really about what it's, what's most important to understand in order to help you uh, learn to thrive with the Thrive Program and overcome emetophobia in, in the process. What's the most important um, basis in which to start your Thrive Program and to really understand why this is going to make so much difference to your life and why um, emetophobia is just you know, a symptom produced by your thinking and your beliefs. So I've called this uh, particular PowerPoint, it's not about being sick and it doesn't happen to you. It's not about being sick and it doesn't happen to you. So emetophobia has actually nothing whatsoever to do with being sick. It's not about being sick, it's not about vomit, it's not about choking, it's not about gagging. It's not about the reality of sickness in any way, shape or form. It's absolutely irrelevant. It's just about thinking styles, belief systems, the way you process information, this kind of stuff. And more importantly, locus of control uh, in the fact that it's not actually something that happens to you, it's something that you're doing to yourself. So let's, uh, let's talk about this for a few minutes. First of all, it's important to realise that Thriving is about managing your thoughts, your beliefs, your imagination, the way you process information well. It's about you having a basic psychological understanding of the way our brains work and the way our psyches process information and events and experiences, things like this. So your symptoms, whatever they are, in this case they're emetophobia, aren't caused by a awful experience you once had about vomiting or being sick. A significant percentage of emetophobes have never even been sick. A further significant percentage don't even remember the last time they were sick. It's nothing to do whatsoever with being sick. It's just about your thinking styles, your beliefs, etc. The way you process information. So when someone is thriving, they are managing, they're in control of the way they think, they're in control of their emotions, uh, they're in control of their habits or they've created useful habits. They're managing their emotions well. They're managing their thinking styles well. So they don't have any unhelpful thinking styles. They've only got helpful thinking styles. Everything this person does, all of their psychological processes are optimised in order for them to have the happiest, most positive um, existence they can possibly have. Somewhere in the middle is resilience. Resilience really just means bouncing back. I'm talking to a lot of head teachers at the moment and business people and they're saying, oh, the byword at the moment is the important thing at the moment is this buzzword, is resilience this, resilience that. And I have to say to them, why are you so hung up on resilience? It's not, it's not a great thing. All resilience means is bouncing back. All resilience means is when you get knocked down, you get back up again. Yeah, that's good. That's a useful skill to have. But it's, it's just as involved. It's no more difficult to teach someone to positively thrive than it is to teach them to bounce back. Bouncing back is just getting up again. And then the other side of the coin, of course, is someone who's struggling, someone who's not thriving, who's clearly um, creating lots of anxiety, lots of problems for themselves in their life. Now I want to go back now, I want to go back to when you're at school and think about when you were first taught, when you first learned how to cook. There's a long time ago uh, that I had a cooking lesson, or the last time I did any cooking, particularly for something like uh, cakes. But I do remember that it was something like um, 6664 or 6444 or something like that, i.e. 6 ounces of water, 4 ounces of flour, 4 ounces of sugar and 2 eggs and a drop of milk or maybe it was 4 ounces of butter or something. But the basic ingredients are the same. You can make a cake with those ingredients in front of you, but also with those same ingredients, uh, with perhaps a slight um, uh, added uh, alternate, you could make bread. Or change something a little bit more and you can make a souffle. Change it a little bit more and you could make uh, Yorkshire puddings or even pancakes. Add a little bit of chocolate to that and suddenly you've got a chocolate cake. What I'm getting at is the main ingredients are the same. Those of you that cook at home, and bearing in mind you're emetophobes watching this, probably most of you do your own cooking, you've probably got no more than 10 or 12 main ingredients in your cupboard, your fridge, that you use for most of the cooking that you do. 
And if you, you know, what's the difference between ragu for bolognese and ragu for um, chili? Not very much at all. Maybe one or two small extra ingredients. It's the same ingredients. Wherever you go in the world, if you want to make a sponge cake, the ingredients are exactly the same. That cookery process, that cooking process, is identical wherever you go. It's completely predictable. If you use those ingredients you can see in front of you and you cook in a fan-assisted oven for 20 minutes on 180, for example, you will always, always get a nice cake. It's that predictable. Decrease the amount of sugar or increase the amount of flour or add one more egg and it's going to change it. It's not going to change it much, but it is going to change it. Those ingredients always produce the same sort of cake, the same um, that, that, that you, you cook the same thing every time with those ingredients. It's completely predictable. Change an ingredient, you change the cake. Another example would be colours. Okay, wherever you go in the world, in the world, no matter what you do, wherever you go, no matter what you do, if you add yellow and blue together, you are always going to get green. Green is made from yellow and blue. A cake is made from those ingredients there. Green is made from yellow and blue. Purple is made from blue and red. Orange comes from yellow and red. No matter where you go, there's nothing you can do to change that fact. That is a scientific fact. Those two, if you like, ingredients together, yellow and blue, always, always make green. It's that predictable colours. The same thing goes for thinking styles and beliefs. The same thing goes for the thinking styles and beliefs that are part of the Thrive programme. Let me give an example. So people often ask me, and it was a subject that came up yesterday, you know, why is the Thrive programme different? Why, how different is the Thrive programme to something else? I've done CBT, I've done therapy, I've done psychotherapy, I've done this, that and the other. What's different about this? In fact, this lady I was speaking to yesterday from Sweden said that a psychiatrist told her that it's impossible to overcome emetophobia. All you can do is learn to live with it. And I said to her, I'm not surprised that he said that. Um, because if you think about it, your average psychiatrist, how often does he see emetophobia? How often does he see or treat emetophobes? I don't know, maybe five or six a year, something like that. Even even a psychologist specialising it probably only sees maybe one or two at a time. I saw five or six emetophobes every single week for 25 years. Five or six a week for 25 years. That is a lot of emetophobes. So I have a great deal of experience in working with emetophobes, which is partly why this program is different, but more importantly still, imagine that you, uh, the person watching this video right now, imagine you have got five friends at the moment that are depressed. You've got five depressed friends, and let's say that you see them all this week for coffee. Just within one week of seeing five friends that are depressed, you're gonna realize that actually those depressed people are all saying more or less the same thing. Their thinking styles are more or less the same. You're going to find that they're brooding and that they feel powerless and that their self-esteem is low and that they feel pretty hopeless. So you're going to recognise very, very quickly that all your depressed friends seem to act and talk and think and believe more or less the same thing. Imagine then if you had five or six anorexic friends at the moment. Five or six anorexic friends and you saw them all next week, you'd have to see them within a short space of time to think to yourself, oh my God, they're, they're saying the same thing. Jenny is saying exactly the same thing that Claire said yesterday. In other words, you'd need to see a lot of people with a certain um, symptom, disorder, whatever, over a short space of time to realise that the similarities between their thinking and their beliefs and the way they're processing information are very, very similar very very similar i would go one step further i'd say it's absolutely predictable it's as predictable as those colors and it's as predictable as those ingredients that that person is going to have emetophobia or me or depression or a fear of flying or something else 
It's utterly predictable. Your phobia is a symptom of your thinking styles and your beliefs, not the other way around. Okay, you haven't got an external locus of control and high social anxiety and low self-esteem because you've got a metaphobia. You've got a metaphobia because you've got those things. Those are the ingredients that create a metaphobia. So at the Thrive Programme then stems from, I basically spent about 10,000 hours over a 25 year period, one on one with clients, 40 clients a week, week in, week out, listening to their them describe what they believe and their thinking styles and the way they process information. And that's what created the Thrive Programme. And that's why the Thrive Programme is different to anything else out there. So it doesn't surprise me when I get emails from all over the world, people saying, oh, my psychiatrist, my therapist, my consultant doesn't think he can help me, doesn't believe you can overcome emetophobia. That's utter nonsense, but I'm not surprised they think that way because they haven't treated enough of them to understand it well enough to be able to help. Now let's take this metaphor one step further. We've got our, we've got our, our um, uh, making a cake, we've got our ingredients for making a cake, we've got our ingredients, if you like, to create all these different colours and pictures and patterns, and these are our other ingredients, and these are our thrive ingredients. Now these aren't all the bricks, um, lost a couple of them, but imagine, if you would, that there are 25 ingredients within the Thrive programme, 25 components, most of them are there, and you'll recognise these as chapters and parts of your book. At the top you've got thinking styles, you've got the paranoid thinking style, negative, compulsive, black and white, perfectionist, obsessive brooder, hypervigilance, you've got cycles of behaviour, desire for control, locus of control, social anxiety, self-esteem, Coup's law, self-awareness, all those different things. Some things that are missing include things like disgust, propensity and a couple of other things. But you're getting the general idea. These are the ingredients. These are your psychological ingredients, your psychological components. Everyone's got access to these things. Everyone's got access to these 25 ingredients, um, or their psychological ingredients, their psychological components. It's then what you do with them. For example, I've said on a few occasions, particularly in a course I recently took, that um, without being rude or, or seeming hurtful to anyone who's depressed at the moment, but I say that depression is one of the most simple things for us to help with the Thrive Programme. It's a very easy thing for us to help with the Thrive Programme. And generally speaking, if someone consults to go through Thrive and they're depressed, it's usually cleared up by the end of the second session, very, very quickly. And the reason for that is it's very, very simple. Depression in Thrive parlance is a very, very simple symptom to overcome because it's just three of those Lego bricks. Locus of control, desire for control, brooding. That's it. Three bricks. External locus of control, strong desire for control, and brooding. Usually, always, there's a self-esteem issue there as well. So call it three and a half bricks. Really, really simple. It's a really simple cake to make, if you like depression. It's a simple thing to create um, in terms of your thinking styles and your beliefs. Think about a, a slightly bigger phobia, think an average phobia then, a phobia of a fear of cancer, for example, that might be four or five bricks. A sexual problem is usually five or six bricks, something like that. Emetophobia, 25 bricks, all of them. Depression is three bricks, emetophobia is 25 bricks. It is a complicated psychological symptom. It's a complicated thing. That's why traditional therapies are no use to treating it. CBT, very use, useless in treating emetophobia. Almost all other treatment plans around the world are pretty hopeless in treating emetophobia and helping people with emetophobia. Because A, the people that created them don't understand enough about it and B, You've got to do something to have an effect on all of these component parts. You've got to affect all of these things. Changing your self-esteem isn't going to get you over emetophobia. Challenging your perfectionist thinking isn't by itself going to get you over emetophobia. You've got to do lots of things. You've got to attack it on from many different angles. And that, of course, is what the Thrive Programme does. The Thrive Programme 
teaches you how to thrive. So the Thrive program teaches you how to manage effectively all of your 25 components. So even if you've got a very complicated disorder, like a metaphobia, you're still going to overcome it by learning to thrive. When someone comes through a meta, uh, sorry, through the Thrive program, they've got a metaphobia, we're not taking them on to help them overcome their metaphobia. I don't take clients on to get them over their metaphobia. I take them on to get them to thrive. By learning to thrive during that process, they are going to overcome their metaphobia because they are going to be managing much better their thinking styles, their beliefs, etc., that caused it in the first place. So these are the component parts of metaphobia. And just as an aside, you can see then why there tends to be high comorbidity uh, with a metaphobia with things like anorexia and OCD. Comorbidity means um, shared with other symptoms, other symptoms that often go together. You know, quite a few emetophobes, you know, have OCD or bordering on OCD. Quite a few emetophobes have um, or have been in the past anorexic. Okay, they're very, very similar. Go back to the ingredients again, and the only real difference between emetophobia and say anorexia is really disgust propensity. And metaphobes generally have a strong disgust propensity and are focused particularly on um, things that disgust them, like being sick, like vomiting. Take away that disgust propensity Lego brick and you'd probably have OCD instead. Those are metaphobes watching, listening to that, this now. If you didn't have your disgust propensity, you'd probably be consulting for OCD. Let's say instead then to take away the disgust propensity Lego brick, that particular ingredient, and we'll change it for another one. Let's change it for a sense of body dysmorphia, of focusing on your body, you're gonna have anorexia. It only takes one more brick. The DNA to create a metaphobia is 95% the same as the DNA to create um, anorexia or OCD. They're so similar. Anorexia and OCD probably are 23, 24 Lego bricks. ME, post-viral fatigue, chronic fatigue. Again, very, very similar in their setup to this. Probably only two or three Lego bricks different to these. They share a lot of the same ingredients. So hopefully you're seeing that emetophobia is, is a symptom of your thinking and your beliefs and the way you process information. It's not the other way around. It's not the other way around. The more internal we are, uh, the more powerful we feel. And of course, a byproduct of that is the more powerful we feel, the less anxious we feel, the less we create anxiety, the, the more calm our thinking styles are. The more external we are, the greater our um, unhelpful thinking styles. And I can demonstrate that here. We look at this graph along the bottom then, and this is only a, a rough idea. Uh, along the bottom, we've got your, your locus of control score and up the, up the side, you've got the gen, you know, a general amalgam of your uh, thinking style score. You imagine you put all your thinking styles together and uh, scored them out of 10. The more external you become, the higher you score on the thinking styles. In other words, the more external a person is, the more, um, the stronger, the more unhelpful their thinking style. The more catastrophic they are, the more powerless they are, the more negative they are, the more paranoid they are, the greater their learned helplessness, the more hypervigilance they have. The more external you are, the higher you're gonna score on all the unhelpful thinking styles. And of course, the opposite is also true. The higher you score across your thinking styles, the more external you're going to be. Because, of course, you're going to feel very external, out of control, if every five minutes you're, you're filled with really, really strong, dramatic emotions. You're going to feel out of control and powerless. This is why it's so important to not just create a more internal locus as you're going through the Thrive Programme, but also to put effort into managing your thinking styles better. You could do it without managing your thinking styles, because decreasing your locus of control score is going to have a very positive effect on your thinking styles. 
but much better, much more powerful to work on all of these things at once. Let's have a look at the next slide. And I've shaded that in. You can see that the more external you are, the, the higher the scores on those thinking styles. And anything less than sort of 10 on a local to control score, you can see that the thinking styles just don't have so much negative effect upon you. Here is this now a person scoring 19 or 20. If you reduce your score from 30 down to just 19 or 20, see how much calmer your thinking styles are. Reduce that again down to 10, and you've got this minor thing. This thinking style, if you score 10 on your locus of controls um, quiz, on the space quiz, if you only score 10, your, your thinking styles, you're never going to score more than two or three on your thinking styles quiz. Your, your, your thinking styles are never going to get out of control. You're never going to get paranoid. You're never going to get hypervigilant. You're never going to get catastrophic or feel really, really negative because all your thinking styles are under control because your thinking styles are a symptom of how powerless you feel in a number of key situations in life. What are those situations again? They are things like fate, luck and chance, superstitions, religiosity, spirituality, paranormal forces, social influences like significant other people, authority figures, fear of being punished, fear of being told off, the thoughts, emotions and fears and anxieties you have. Things like perceived current external influences, such as pressure at work, the weather, health, relationships, kind of stuff. And then things like the past, your childhood experiences. Most people think and believe that their past is having some kind of hold, some kind of impact upon them, which of course, hopefully by now you realise isn't true. So these are the external beliefs that people believe influence their lives, have some influence over their life. And the more of these that you have, the more external you will be. The more external you are, the more catastrophic your thinking styles are. The higher you're going to score on them, the more out of control you're going to feel. So if you imagine then a locus of control as a continuum for a minute, and let's just say, and I'm being very, I'm generalising quite a lot here, but if you imagine then, just for, for black and white, for sake of argument, for clarity, that someone who would score only one or two on our space locus of control quiz would have an internal locus of control, an internal sense of power and control over their life. They'd feel quite powerful. They'd feel powerful people. And then at the other end of the spectrum, someone that scores 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, they have an external sense of power. But basically for these people, they believe that life happens to them. They believe they don't have any control over what happens in their life. Life just happens to them and it's tough shit and they just got to relax, or react to that. And they feel powerless. Obviously, you want to be as internal as you possibly can be. Now, if you see someone then with an, an, a general internal locus of control, um, all their locus of control scores might be around the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 region. And these little green lines here that I've highlighted here are just an example of where someone's beliefs might lie across those domains that I just talked about earlier, things like religiosity, spirituality, fate, luck and chance, all that kind of stuff. Now imagine your average emetophobe who scores, you know, 24, 25, 26 on the locus of control quiz. You can see the difference, you can see in this figure that most of their beliefs they have about the key important things in their life are very external, they're powerless beliefs. They believe that instead of having power and control over these things, they feel powerless because they believe that these things are happening to them. Now let's add in something very, very specific. Let's add in a belief in ghosts. Add in a belief in ghosts. So let's say, and I've put that somewhere around number 27 on our locus of control quiz. Okay, a belief in actual ghosts. Okay, and it took me ages to draw that little picture, so I hope you appreciate that. You can see how easy it would be for somebody that scored 24, 25, 26 on the locus of control quiz to believe in ghosts. They're, all, they're almost already believing in ghosts. All their beliefs are around that kind of thing. They already believe in magical external forces. They already believe in fate and luck and chance. They already have lots of powerless beliefs. 
It's not a huge step for somebody that scores 24, 25 on a locus of control quiz to believe in ghosts. Why not? Yeah, I can believe that. They believe in all that kind of stuff anyway, like horoscopes and tarot cards and this kind of stuff. It's a very small leap of faith for someone that scores 24, 25 on a locus of control quiz to believe in ghosts. It's an easy thing for you to do. You don't have to step out of your comfort zone. You don't have to stretch your imagination too much to believe in ghosts. Now look at the person that was in the earlier part of that, the one, two, three, four. It's a huge change for an internal person who feels powerful to believe in ghosts. It's a huge leap of faith. They'd have to really, really suffer in life, undergo tremendous stress and pressure or some catastrophic event in their life in order to get them to believe in ghosts. And again, I want you to realise here that your answers to the quiz, to the statements on the locus of control quiz, aren't based on any reality at all. They're solely based on how powerful you feel. I'll give you an example. I've just taken a lady from London through the programme and she scored 25 when we did the quiz uh, on the first session. Only one week later, one week later, we didn't go all the way through the quiz again, but we looked at some of the questions. Her quiz score dropped by half in the space of one week. She went from 25 down to 12 in one week after just go, doing the locus of control quiz. Now, this lady had, didn't go back and revisit the quiz at all. She hadn't thought a great deal about those quiz answers in the previous week. She hadn't done the exercise where she went back and looked at them individually. In fact, she hadn't thought about them at all. So how on earth can her locus of control quiz change score in one week? What she did do that week was go away and felt much more powerful. She went away and she felt and she thought in a much more powerful internal way. So a week later when I say to her, are you sure you can't run a marathon or climb Everest? This week she says, do you know what Rob? I actually think I could. And I say this week, do you not think that you could make millions of pounds without needing a lot of luck? And she said, do you know what Rob? I think I could. And this is because she feels more powerful. She hasn't changed her job. Nothing else has changed in her life. She just feels more powerful because she's thinking differently. And because she's thinking differently, her beliefs about her skill set, her beliefs about what happens to her in life has changed completely. This is why it's so important for you to create an internal locus of control. It's very difficult if you've got an internal locus of control to think or believe in magic and fate and luck and chance. It's very difficult if you've got an internal locus of control to have lots of social anxiety. It's very difficult if you've got an internal locus of control to have low self, to have low self esteem. If you've got an internal locus of control, you are going to have high self esteem because the two things go hand in hand. It's very difficult for someone who's got an internal locus and who feels powerful to suddenly feel under a lot of pressure from other people. They're much less likely to respond to social pressures than someone who's external because it's a simple thing for them to do. It's an easy thing, it's an easy thing. If you believe in ghosts, then what's the next thing? It's easy, if you already believe in ghosts, it's easy to believe in mediums, isn't it? If you believe in mediums, it's easy to believe in uh, life after death and um, that people can talk to ghosts. It's easy to believe that someone could contact your dead grandfather and have a chat with them on your behalf. If you're already scoring 25 out of 30, if you already believe um, in fatalistic, paranoidal, uh, paranormal as well, magical beliefs, it's very easy for you to believe those things. And what you don't realise is what people don't realise, the more you believe in those things, the more powerless you are making yourself. Move on to this. You may have seen this picture before. I've talked about this before. Along the bottom line then is your sense of power and control, your locus of control score again out of 30. And up the left hand side you've got your desire for control. Something fairly unique, one of the ingredients unique to emetophobia and OCD and anorexia is a very strong desire for control. 
So if you go along the bottom there and you imagine that you scored 25, 26 on your locus of control quiz, and then you go up to what you scored on your desire for control quiz, which is probably nine or 10, you'll realize you're in that danger area in the top right hand side. And what we're talking about there is someone who feels powerless, but he's got a strong desire for control and power. So this is a person who feels completely out of their depth the whole time and panicking the whole time because they don't believe they've got the skill set to manage what's going on in their life. And you can see along the bottom, as you reduce your sense of power and control, as you create a more internal locus, you come out of that red area, out of the orange area, into a green area. You can see from the graph that you do need to have a desire for control, somewhere ideally between two and six on our quiz, because you do need to want some control in life, otherwise you never get out of bed in the morning. You have to have a desire for control, otherwise you just wouldn't get up in the morning. So you want to reduce your desire for control score from nine or 10 down to six or less. And you want to uh, reduce your locus of control score to much less than 10, but certainly anything under 10 would be great. You could not have a metaphobia if you only scored 10 on our locus of control quiz. It would be impossible because your metaphobia is created by your external locus of control. Make it more internal, everything calms down, and Bob's your uncle. The other thing that I talk about on this first session, and it's really, really important to recognise, is that if a metaphobia was genuinely scary, if being sick was genuinely frightening or scary, many more people would suffer from it. More importantly, many more men would suffer from it. Now, depending on which research paper you believe, somewhere between 95 to 97% of emetophobes are female. 95 to 97%. That's huge. Almost every single emetophobe, at least nine out of 10 emetophobes are female. With any other phobia, the spread, the split between the sexes is usually around 50-50. Sometimes as much as 60-40, but generally speaking, just as many men as women have a fear of flying. Just as many men as women have a fear of snakes, or spiders, or darkness, or dying, or crashing, etc, etc, etc. Emetophobia, 95 to 97% women. The simple reason for that, one of those early ingredients I talked about, one of those Lego bricks, one of those psychological components, is called disgust propensity. Disgust propensity. Disgust propensity relates to, uh, in our, for our purposes at least, anyway, how much sense of disgust you would create, usually about your body or about your bodily functions. So disgust propensity relates to how you feel about weeing, pooing, shit, going to the toilet, snot, bogies, blood, blood, period blood, menstrual blood, even earwax and the, and the sleep in the corner of your eye in the morning, that kind of stuff. Spitting. Men spit much more than women do. Men fart much more than women do. And they love it. They love it. I've asked professors at Cambridge University in front of their children, in front of their daughters got emetophobia, to admit to her that when he's in the house by himself, not only does he fart, but he farts as loud as he can, and the smellier the better. This is abhorrent to most women that are brought up, most girls around the world are brought up to be sugar and spice and all things nice, and to be lovely, pretty, sweet little things. And with that, that feminization, if you like, comes high disgust propensity. Mary, the emetophobe, was uh, 81 years old when I asked her, and she'd never had a wee in front of another human being. Boys we in front of other boys from age two onwards. It's complete, bodily functions are completely normalized for men and boys. So you get over any sense of disgust about bodily fluids, etc. You get over at a very early age for boys, but for girls, they're not educated away from it. In fact, they're, they're made to I think even more about that and society, the pressure and the social pressure put on young girls to look and feel and behave in a certain way is one of the reasons why women have much higher amounts of disgust propensity than men do. So that single Lego brick, that single component 
is the reason why far more women have emetophobia than men. So it's got nothing whatsoever to do with being sick. But rather than that, that thinking component, that belief system. Okay? If emetophobia genuinely was about being sick, and being sick was genuinely frightening, then any woman that goes through morning sickness would be more likely to develop emetophobia. And in fact, they're less likely. If emetophobia was genuinely about being sick and being sick was genuinely frightening and scary, then anyone going through chemotherapy would be more likely to develop emetophobia. And in fact, they're less likely. If it were genuinely scary, you'd be more likely to develop it after having a vomiting bug. And in fact, you're less likely. It's got nothing whatsoever to do with being sick. And everything to do with a fear of being out of control, a fear of embarrassing yourself, high social anxiety, disgust propensity, obsessive brooding, catastrophizing, perfectionism, and all these other thinking styles. It does not happen to you. It is something that you have created in your head and is utterly predictable. If I'd have known you when you were six years old, I could have said to your parents, be careful, if she carries on going the same way, she's going to have a metaphobia by the time she's 10. A metaphobia is a product of your thinking styles, your beliefs, your psychological knowledge, your self-awareness and the way you process information. Manage those things better, create a more internal locus, and your metaphobia will just disappear as you're learning to thrive. I hope this has been helpful. Please feel free to ask any questions that you've got. Thanks very much.